Welcome back to Expert Instruction, the Teach by Design podcast, where we dive deeper into the research surrounding student behavior by talking with the people implementing these practices, where they work, and with the students they support. I'm Megan Cave. I'm Nadia Sampson. Okay, y'all. This month, we're exploring the topic of play in our schools. Over in our Teach by Design article, we introduced the continuum of play that comes from Dr. Angela Pyle and Erica Daniels' research. Basically, they decided to disrupt the binary by saying an activity doesn't all isn't always play or learning. Sometimes it's both. And on that continuum, there are actually five types of learning that go from fully child-directed to teacher-directed. You guys, that's right. Sometimes the things that you do, the lessons you teach can be described as play. Yeah. The five types of play are free play, inquiry play, collaborative play, playful learning, and learning through games. So today we're going to immerse ourselves in that first type, that unstructured child-directed type of play called free play. Joining us in the conversation is Dr. Michelle Bommel and Nellie Huggins. Michelle is the Clotilda Winter Professor of Education and an Associate Professor of Early Childhood Education, there's more, (laughs) in the Department of Teaching and Learning Sciences at Texas Christian University. She got one of them long academic titles. Yes. Yes. Her current research focuses on early childhood and elementary teacher education and social studies curriculum. She is also a play consultant as part of the Link Project's research team. Michelle used to be an elementary school teacher, and she knows the importance of finding ways to help kids get the time they need for creative expression, play, and meaningful instruction in schools. Mm -hmm. Nally is a veteran in the field of early childhood education with a passion for advocating for young children and their families to receive the very best quality care and services to not just develop appropriately, but thrive. She joins us today, having spent the last 22 years working in every setting and every role possible, from infant care to preschool teacher to preschool owner and director. Climb that ladder. Currently, she's the Parent Outreach Coordinator for Early Childhood Cares at the University of Oregon, an organization providing early (laughs) intervention and early childhood special education to infants, toddlers, and preschool age children in Lane County. Nellie is also a community trainer, and she offers professional development for care providers and educators throughout Oregon. Together, the four of us had the best time talking about what it means to give kids, like we're talking little kids, all the way through to high school kids, the time and space to have uninterrupted, unstructured time to focus on what they want to do. In this episode, we're going to talk about what do, what do we even mean by when we talk about free play? How do kids benefit when they play that way? How much time should they spend engaged in free play? How, you guys, how in the world do you transition (laughs) from recess, an unstructured space like recess, all the way back to direct instruction, sitting in desks? What would it look like to give middle and high school students similar opportunities for free play? And what are some super tangible strategies you can do right now to make sure your students get the time they need to play freely? Check it out. Well, Nellie and Michelle, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so glad to be here. Thanks for having (laughs) us. Thank you so much for having us, Megan. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Hey, so we're here today to talk a little bit about play. So our article this month, um, we've talked a little bit about the, well, not a little bit, a lot of bit about the continuum of play, that um, it doesn't have to look one way and it doesn't always have to be child directed, um, that grownups can get involved in directing that play too. But something that we really wanted to focus on today was around that, uh, that free play. And so it would help, I think, for everyone, if we could just start by defining what we mean when we're talking about free play um, and maybe what that, how it's different from the other types of play-based learning that can happen in schools and early childhood programs. Someone want to start? Nelly, would you like to start? I I would love to. Um, so when we talk about just play in general, um, usually that means someone has thought ahead of time ways to prompt or initiate or provoke a specific type of play that then leads to learning. But when we talk about free play um, in, in my field, that means there's no structure to it. There's no requirement. There's no, it just means children 
are given permission and allowed uninterrupted blocks of time where they can do whatever they want. So there's no curriculum planning involved. There's no, it's just a block of time that's just theirs mm -hmm. to choose what they would like to do, what interests them and what um, excites them. Yes, and in an elementary school, you can think of the classic example of unstructured or free play, recess, right? It's child directed. We uh, plan that to take place in a safe environment where there's no adult interference. Adult nope. intervention as needed, sure. But yeah, sure, right. <laughs> right. It's not a total free for all out there, right? We're watching. Adult, adult <laughs> supervision, sure. Yes. No one yeah. here, so. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. Great. Um, you know, when um, Michelle, in the work that you've done, um, we did a little bit of reading about the research that you've that you've done related to research. And in that research, there was a definition that was provided in there that said that unstructured play was free play that's child directed within a safe environment with no adult interference. And as I read that over and over again, I was like, what if I changed child directed to self-directed? And so it became play that is self-directed and uh, in a safe place with no interference. And I was like, isn't that, isn't that something that everyone wants? And that maybe like by calling it play, it somehow diminishes what it is. Um, but really um, it's something that everyone would like is that, that unstructured time where we can explore and use our imaginations and think about things in a way that no one else can come and interfere with that. And so I just I I just wanted to share that because I think as we start to talk about free play and we think about recess and we think about kids and playing in early childhood settings that we could be thinking about it as like kids playing with blocks or running around on a playground or something like that. But I think it is also important for us to remember that in the definition, it really is just a block of time that is unstructured where kids get the opportunity to do what they want to do and explore how they want to explore. So anyway, yes. Anyway, um, also within that, we had talked about Nellie and I, well, we're friends. And <laughs> at some point moons ago, we had talked about, we were in, we were having a conversation about play and rest. And, um, and as we were talking, because I was interested in figuring out like what it means to actually rest and Nellie, your work centers around play and how to incorporate play. And we, uh, we kind of reached this conclusion that the benefits are really similar and so, like the benefits for adults that rest has, um, are similar to the benefits that kids experience when they play. So maybe, maybe the two of you could talk a little bit about the benefits that we see from unstructured free play. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I was thinking of as you were talking, Megan, was how in some schools, the language of using recess sort of feels like something negative. And so I've, I've also heard it called brain breaks, mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe as a way to kind of give it some legitimacy that, oh, we've been using our brains. And so let's take ah. a break. It's still recess, <laughs> you know, um, and for adults, for adults, we call it self-care, right? Yeah. So for whatever age group we're talking about, young children through adults, you know, those main domains of the physical, the social, emotional, the cognitive, right? Um, yeah. we're, we're experiencing growth or activity in all of those areas through free play. However, you want to label it: brain breaks, <laughs> unstructured <laughs> self care. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And brain breaks is uh, that is also um, a phrase where I come from, and it always makes me chuckle a little bit because I don't want to tell anyone, but your brain is still working. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but if that's what it needs to sound like to be more palatable, I'm fully in support. Yeah, we won't tell them just yet. That surprise, your brain is still very much engaged while you play. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that. Um, well, you know, and just to piggyback off of sure. um, what we were just saying, play, the word play is stigmatized and it does get a bad rap. Even in early childhood, I cannot tell you how many parents have said the words, do they just play all day? <laughs> ah, yeah. And that's the saddest thing in the world for an early childhood um, educator to hear, because the answer is I wish. Mm. 
I wish they did. That would be ideal um, Mm -hmm. because it's not mindless. It's actually, we're engaging every single domain. We are developing in every area. We're just doing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So we can, I can't get enough unstructured play in early childhood. If you were to ask me, I would say, yeah, I would love for them to play all day. Children, all day long. children all day long. this much. Stri- yeah. So they're getting they're getting some social benefits, right? By so so many with each other. Um, they're learning how to talk to each other and to collaborate and uh, what it means to follow the rules related to someone else's play yes. social. Um, go ahead no yeah social constructs this is where we learn them right mm-hmm. early childhood it's the foundation of social skills so and they're learning social rules they're learning empathy because they're watching mm-hmm. other people struggle yeah they're learning their their executive function is strengthening in real time which is why it makes me laugh that people call it a brain break because it's actually strengthening the executive function and they're just releasing stress you know mm-hmm. like Small, but all bodies store stress. Things happen throughout the day. We store it. Children release that stress through play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think too, that in early childhood settings, it can be more acceptable for kids to play. Um, And so they might get more opportunities for that in early childhood settings than they would in elementary school. And then certainly than they would in secondary schools, middle school and high school. So I, um, when we had talked earlier, we had we had kind of landed on this place where in early childhood, kids are getting that strong foundational component to these Mm -hmm. social, emotional, interpersonal skills. Um, And that uh, play actually gives them those opportunities. And then those kids move into elementary schools where Michelle, you see additional benefits in, or maybe similar, just more in elementary schools. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So those foundational skills are built in those early years, and then they need to keep practicing and they need to keep exercising and growing in all of those domains, right? So if you imagine um, a group of second graders on a playground at recess and they have limited equipment, say there's one set of monkey bars, they've got to learn how to resolve conflicts, you know, who gets Mm. to go first? Um, How are we going to share this equipment? They have to communicate with each other. They all start um, giving each other tips about how to get across, you know, they're um, learning to regulate. It's not my turn yet. So, you know, I have to be patient when they fall. They are learning, right? And uh, how to pick themselves back up. That's right, to be resilient. And then when they succeed, they're so confident in themselves and they want to go learn more. So there's just so much that can happen in, in, you know, just a short amount of time, even Mm -hmm. on the playground. And in our world over here um, within PBIS, when we're talking about student behaviors, um, we often hear from people that as a result of a misbehavior, um, that kids are, as a consequence, they're withheld from recess. And so by offering that as a consequence, by saying to a kid, I'm sorry, you're going to have to miss recess today because of this, you're, we're actually withholding opportunities to engage with those parts of their learning. And we just had a series that we did around dysregulation um, and uh, and de-escalation. And part of that work too is around helping kids to understand and name their emotions and to work through those in a way that is um, constructive, I guess. Um, And as, and I feel like based on the things that you guys were both talking about, that, that this opportunity for free play on in recess um, in early childhood places, that it gives them an outlet where it's safe to explore how to do that and to practice how to do those things to calm themselves down. And so, um, so yeah, it's all kind of related for me, um, all of this work both in the PBIS realm, as well as in um, the work that you guys do. It's all kind of related to each other. Yeah, it's really bringing to mind to the (laughs) fact that when students um, are prohibited, you know, they're punished um, by not going out to recess. It's usually because of behavior, and maybe this is what you're saying, behavior that they actually need to be 
practicing with their peers and mm-hmm. were den- yeah I mean I think that's what you're saying but to me I was just kind of simplifying in my head it's denying them the opportunity to actually practice the behavior that got them in trouble in the first place. in the first place yeah in your experience how much time should kiddos kids be in free play how much time should they spend in free play and does that look different in early childhood settings versus elementary settings and um michelle you you mentioned link your work with link and maybe this is an opportunity for you to kind of talk a little bit about um those benefits of for example the the 15 the four 15 minute recesses so just looking at the differences between the the settings and um yeah how much time? Nelly says all day, every day. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, well, we have research about it. I love research and data. And so do we. It's how, I, it's how I argue in defense of play. Of course. Is These are facts. Through the research. Here's some facts. You want some data? Here we uh-huh. go. Uh-huh. The people at Harvard say at least in early development, at least an hour a day uh-huh. in a perfect world, one third of their day would be spent in free play. But if we can't do that, and I imagine not a lot of people can, one hour is the recommended minimum. In my experience, um, adult supervised and maybe lightly, you know, intervening, intervening yeah. if maybe, uh, play can last for hours because they get lost in it. And letting them get lost in it like that is so beneficial to their development in every way. So in my world, in a perfect world, it would be unlimited facilitated you know guided not thought not sloppy but um in my world they would have as much time as they want because it cannot be underestimated the benefits mm-hmm. and i think nelly that's such a great point because i'm imagining for example four year olds playing a uh, restaurant right yeah. they need an extended amount of time to decide on the roles and get their story going they need that extended amount of time uh, in elementary schools, <clears throat> it's more difficult as we can imagine because of the content expectations mm-hmm. and sort of that traditional schooling model of we sit down, we do our work, you know, we go to lunch, maybe we have a recess break. Um, it seems as though many elementary schools are sort of uh, designed by schedule around, you know, arrival, lunch and dismissal and recess sort of fits somewhere in there. Um, With the LINK project, which stands for Let's Inspire Innovation and Kids, um, basically the school schedule for elementary grades is designed around arrival, lunch, dismissal, and four recess periods. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So the children have a total of one hour of free play, but it's spread throughout the day in 15 minute increments. And this project was inspired by... uh, Nordic countries such as Finland and um, in other countries, there are children who have, as a regular part of the day, um, a recess break for about 15 or 20 minutes, about every hour for about every hour of schooling. I feel like we need to just pause for a second and let our listeners just take that in because this is a real shift for us American U.S. folk, right? Like I think about my own education in elementary school. I think about my kids and what they have gone through in elementary school. And um, my second grader is jealous of the kindergartners who get three recesses during the day and she gets two. And, um, And so this would be a phenomenal shift in practice to have four recesses for kids. So, um, so in your work, the recommendation is similar to what the folks at Har- the good folks at Harvard have recommended, which is that kids get an hour of mm-hmm. this time a day. And mm-hmm. uh, you have seen it work where schools allow for four 15-minute recesses and they still achieve the same academic standards. Right. We have yeah. not found in our work that having those multiple recess periods a day is detrimental to their schoolwork. I should add though, that um, the LINK project 
um, with Debbie Ray, Dr. Debbie Ray is a colleague of mine at Texas Christian University who came up with the LINK project. She's the, uh, the lead on the whole initiative. Um, she was very deliberate about beginning small. And so if a school signs up to or, or decides to engage with the LINK project, we start with the kindergarten and the first grade. Um, and we work very closely with those teachers so that recess becomes part of the routine. And the children also learn that this is how school is um, in kindergarten and first grade. And then as those children grow and move to the next grade level, then the school will add, okay, now second grade is doing multiple recess mm -hmm. and now third grade. And another key um, to this working is a character education program. If you think about it, sometimes we see children at recess or, or engaging in unstructured play and they're just fighting or they're not getting along and they're miserable, they're tattling. And so if that is not going well for one recess to try to expand it, would just make things worse. Oh, sure. Yeah. So so with the Link Project, there's a character education piece that um, accompanies this multiple recess um, project. And you're right, we've seen the kids are happier. The teachers are happier. They they mm -hmm. talk to us about the the cognitive benefits, also how they're getting along better on the playgrounds and with each other in school. They come back in from those breaks. This is remarkable, really, that the the children come back in from from those fifteen minute recess periods and they're ready to work for the Can most you, part. Uh, sorry, Amazing. Michelle. Can you just briefly? touch on when you say character education, what that looks like. What is what is that? There are many character education programs that are available for teachers in schools. Yeah. And the one that Debbie Ray chose for its research based um, success is called positive action. And so what it looks like in schools is a 15 minute mini lesson yeah. about friendship or about working together or sharing. Uh, sure. So it's a yeah. curriculum that's sure. designed for the teachers and it's very short. Yeah. Um, yes, a daily practice. Yeah, there's a lot of that that happens in the elementary schools within the district here where uh -huh. they spend time talking about these kinds of things. So whatever it is that, that schools are doing, it makes sense to add it as part of this um, as related anyway mm -hmm. to teaching kids about recess. And in our work too, we talk a lot about um, expectations and right. teaching kids like how do you do recess and what what does behavior look like on the playground and when, you know, who how do you get access to certain things? Um, so that all makes sense to me. And I think it actually leads into another question that we had, which is which is, you know, what you were saying around transitions. So, yeah. so you were talking a little bit about, you know, coming those four recesses, for example. Um, so there's got to be a lot of transition that that needs to happen. Um, so that can be pretty challenging. Transitions can be pretty challenging. Mm. Um, so how how do you go? How do you help students go from unstructured to more structured? What does that look like? We talk a lot in PBIS about routines, um, about teaching. You know, this is what this looks like um, and what those routines look like to help students practice. So what does that look like? Um, how do you help students make that shift? I think both in elementary school yes. and in, in early yes, childhood. Thank you. Like, how do you come in and like, transition from free play to some sort of teacher directed something? How do you make that transition work? Um, I'll start. And to piggyback on the PBIS work, the which is a wonderful framework, from my end, EC PBIS, same yes. thing, routines. Um, and it, you know, the best way to take children from something they deeply desire to be doing, mm -hmm. something that you deeply desire they do, <laughs> <laughs> is with a buffer and you can't remove someone from fun and joy and excitement without having fun. So transitions need to be fun. You can't, I can't imagine asking a four-year-old who's like running and playing and squealing and kicking a ball to come in and wash their hands. That mm -hmm. would be so, that's a quick no, but I can imagine asking a four-year-old to dance or huh. race or, you know, make a game out of it <clears throat> to the bathroom at which point we will sing a song about washing our hands uh -huh. while we wash our hands. So it's just about making the transition, um, first of all, not jarring. Mm -hmm. 
uh-huh. an actual smooth transition, like a real trans, like a transition, like a, like a real, like a, like you're, oh, you're, you're oh, saying to, to actually transition is I'm what you're saying. saying. I'm saying, to, yeah, yeah. It's as though, yeah. Transition, we're talking about transition. Okay, okay. okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where I'm from, with, with, you know, the birth to fives, yeah. you absolutely cannot ask a small child to pivot that quickly. No uh, way. Come inside that, and sit down. Yeah. That's what makes transitions terrible. Yeah. You can't ask them to, to like, uh, continue their fun while they come inside. Mm. This is like a slow taper down. It has to be, um a good transition, a well-developed, a well-thought-out yeah. transition that is relevant to the children you're trying to transition. Is and it then, helpful to make it the same? Yes. Um, every the time. Next, <clears throat> what I was about to say is to echo your sentiments, routine. It mm-hmm. needs to be exactly the same. It needs to happen at the same time. It needs to, the expectations need to be the same. They need to know, <clears throat> just like any other part of routine, this is what's going to happen at this time, and here's how it's going to go. It has to be consistent because routines give us comfort and safety. Yeah. And then we learn it just like we learn any other part of the day. This is just when this song, one of my favorite things um, when I was teaching preschool and when I owned a preschool was all of our transitions were songs. There's, there are albums, there are children's musical albums about this. They're just for transitions. So we would, a certain song would come on and they would know that would cue them that the next thing is coming, whether it's a song about washing your hands, whether it's a song about, you know, cleaning up, there's some really great cleanup songs out there and they don't have to be Barney. Um, (laughs) So making it fun for them. And then it it reached a point in, in our preschool when all it would require is the song would come on and their muscle memory and their bodies, it would just kick in. And like, this is what we do now because the song is on. Mm -hmm. So you just have to decide what it's going to be and stick to it. I'll tell you, those songs, they last long into adulthood. <laughs> they are not easy to forget. It's an earworm for sure. Is Michelle, is, uh, so you were talking about routines and how you've seen success happen with kids coming mm-hmm. in from recess four times a day mm-hmm. and being yes. able to transition successfully into academic yes. instruction. So tell us what that looks like in elementary schools. Yes. So we know from the teachers that it... Um, who have implemented the this multiple recess uh, program, that it takes time to learn a routine, right? To make something become a routine. Sure. And so in those early days, the early days of school, there's a lot of practice and modeling and we practice again. Mm-hmm. First, the practice begins with the teachers themselves before the students even yes. arrive. Here's wow. how it's going to work. Everyone yeah, yeah. sets their phone for 10 a.m. When the timer goes off, we calmly bring the lesson to a close and say yeah because grade levels had the same recess yeah in the yes uh uh-huh so by grade level Mm -hmm. and all the teachers knew and so that they could be in sync and walk out as a grade level and walk back inside as a grade level they all had to figure out you know how they could um, time it so that they were all basically leaving their classroom at once and what we found with the the restroom breaks as an example I know when I was a classroom teacher, students love to dawdle in there. I don't know what they do in there, but the children just love to waste time in bathrooms <laughs> with the uh, multiple recess periods. And part of the, the procedure is while you're on your way out, one of the grade level teachers will kind of stay behind for those students who need to go to take care of their business and they want to go outside to play. So there is no dawdling because <laughs> they want to go outside. Uh-huh. So it's a matter of practicing. Um, and we've seen, you know, depending on how close your classroom is to the playground or to outside, within one or two minutes, the children can get outside and start to play. And that's when the 15 minute recess begins. And then they they come back in. It's amazing to watch. And the children are not, I don't know if you've seen this in schools before, but s- for some Children, they have to walk in a straight line with their hands behind their back and the teachers say, catch a bubble. And, you know, so their cheeks are puffed out because they're being very quiet and still like, Mm -hmm. why? Why? With these transitions, the point is to not run, but to walk outside as a group. And so they're quiet, but they're, you know, they're not in a straight line. Their hands are not behind their backs. There's a lead teacher who's leading the class outside Mm -hmm. and the the, there's a teacher who's at the end, the caboose that 
make sure everyone gets outside. So mm-hmm. it, it's practice. Mm-hmm. Well, and it sounds really similar to what Nellie was saying too, that you make the transitions, actual transitions, where you're not asking kids to go directly from running around and playing a game on the field to walking in a straight line, staying very quiet and you know mm-hmm. keeping to themselves, that you allow for a little bit of that movement to continue until you get into the classroom where you have another set of transitions that you make to get back into learning. I think we do this as adults. I was just thinking... Uh, Monday mornings, Mm -hmm. my, you know, the training team I work with, we have a meeting first thing every Monday morning. We don't start talking about work. We start talking about, Hey, how was everyone's weekend? weekend? What's happening for you? What, what, you know, even what kind of support might you need this week? It looks like you have 25 Mm -hmm. webinars to do, you know, things (laughs) like that. And even Megan and I did Mm -hmm. it this morning when we were meeting earlier this morning, we checked in, you know, we take that moment And so it's a little bit different, but it really is a transition to to kind of buffer being on the weekend and in bed (laughs) and Mm -hmm. coming into work. So, yeah, I just Mm -hmm. yeah, we do it as adults and we need it. Yeah. So I think it just gets back to this idea that we're teaching kids all of these skill sets that they're going to need as they continue to grow as people. And um, it's all just practice. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you engage with other people? How do you uh, move from one thing, one activity to the next activity? Um, How do you make that switch in your brain? All of that stuff is is good stuff to teach kids when they're younger. Um, But it's also good stuff to continue teaching kids Mm -hmm. as they get older. And something that I've been really stuck on since I started thinking about all of this is that um, there was a there was an article that um, I found through this research to uh, where it described the the percent of students in elementary schools or the um, it was K through six mm-hmm. the percent of students who had access to recess and uh, it's pretty strong it's like ninety percent and above for kids um, K through five but then you add they added in the those sixth graders and it goes from something like ninety percent at fifth grade having access to recess regular access to recess to thirty five percent so somehow we have made a decision as adults that kids in elementary school should have dedicated time for recess. And everyone else after that, from sixth grade through high school, there was no data related to seventh, eighth through 12th grade in the article I was reading, but I imagine it just steadily, dramatically decreases as you get older, that those students don't need to have regular access to that time. And I know that this isn't necessarily your realm. Early childhood is very different than high school, let's say, but I'm curious um, if in your in your experience researching and um, practicing what play looks like, um, what can free time, what can free play look like in middle school and high school settings? What is that? What would that mean to to give students that time where, like we were saying before, this is time that we all want. This is not just recess. This is not just kids out on a playground playing. This is time, dedicated, unstructured time where they get to choose. What could that look like in middle school and high school? Mm-hmm. Do you guys have ideas? You know, go ahead. No, oh, you go ahead. All right. All right. <laughs> you want to rock, paper, scissors, scissors, right? <laughs> rock, paper, paper, scissors. No, you well, go. I was, I was going to say, I love this question and I think it's a challenge um gosh for middle schools and high schools because when i think about those schools it, you know their schedules are very structured and again it seems to me that this the schedule is based around arrival lunch dismissal definitely but a few years ago i had an opportunity to yeah. visit a waldorf school in germany in mm-hmm. wiesbaden germany and it, this was a school for children in about grade one to high school And a Waldorf education is whole child focused. It's very arts based. And so this was a a school I was able to visit. And what I remember was at 10 o'clock, the entire school had a 20 minute break. So there were middle schoolers, there were high schoolers, there were elementary children, and it wasn't chaotic. The American guests who were watching were just dumbfounded and mesmerized. Can you imagine? A 10 a.m. coffee break at your workplace where people are just taking a break all at the same time. This is what was happening at this school. 
Some children were running around in the playground. Some were sitting down, having a snack. Others were just walking around talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, They all got to choose. And the teachers knew that some teachers were inside, some were outside. There was plenty of adult supervision. But I just, it made me wonder in light of your question, you know, what would it be like if a school, a middle school, a high school decided that they were going to structure the class schedule around not just arrival, lunch, dismissal, but also let's build in a 20 minute break. What would that do to the rest of our schedule? And how might that break really benefit children and adults at those schools? I think that's such a huge philosophical shift Mm -hmm. um, because as, as someone who works in high schools, um, one of the first things we're told is don't mess with the schedule. Oh, the schedule is a big deal. Don't mess with the schedule. (laughs) And so that happens happens down. Yeah. And so I, I I think, (laughs) I think that that is so important. And how do we help people make that philosophical shift? I mean, I think that's a huge challenge, but so critically important. Megan and I were talking about too, she's a little younger than I am. And we were talking about what kindergarten looked like for me and what kindergarten looked like for her. And then what kindergarten looked like for her daughter and my daughter. Mm -hmm. And even that changing what it looks like, you know, mine was play. Mm -hmm. And more and more we've even moved towards, um, you know, it's, Academic Sh- academics. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And so I know that I kind of went a little bit awry, but I do think it's um, it's a philosophical shift. And in some ways, at least in America, we've made a philosophical shift kind of the opposite way. In some ways, we've said, no, 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 more academics, less play, less play. So I, I do think that's really interesting, especially when we're talking about older um, students, because we're actually even doing it with younger students. Yes. Yeah, right. We're right. Yeah, kind of going the other way. It kind of makes me chuckle, Megan, when I hear you say that. What grade does it drop off? Did you say? Uh, Sixth grade, between fifth and sixth grade. It kind of makes me chuckle and not in like a ha-ha way, Mm -hmm. but I can't, this is not my area of expertise, but I've met some sixth graders Mm -hmm. and I used to be one. I can't imagine a trickier or less convenient time to take away the opportunity to socialize and build relationships. You're not wrong. Sixth grade. Yeah. It just seems so counterintuitive to me. I have a sixth grader and a second grader in my house. And when you were talking, Michelle, about playing restaurant the other day, the second grader really wanted to play some restaurant. She really did. And so she often will rope her older sister into playing this imaginative game and they will play for an hour at least where they're like, now they've got pads of paper and they've got a menu and they've got credit cards and they've got everything out there they're they brought down several toys that look nothing like food but now they are food and like they've just they evolve that play and they play it for days you know they have like a time when they want to do it and so I don't think that middle schoolers are opposed to this kind of thing they were given this opportunity the year before so it's got to be a real dynamic issue to go from having that time where you can just see your friends, socialize, talk, play, whatever, to now being in a place where you don't have access to that time. There's a local middle school that has recently piloted a program called their, they call it a flex period, Mm. where um, right after kids arrive, they go to their advisor and they get the announcements and whatever. And then, so they've shortened their advisor time and um, they've expanded to add this flex period. I'm not sure if it's every day, but um, but kids are allowed to go where they want. They can go see a teacher if they want extra help with something. They can hang out with their friends in the gym, in the cafeteria, whatever. There are extracurricular activities that are offered clubs that meet um, during that time. So it seems like there are opportunities to keep it um, to keep it in these older grade levels, but it does require flexibility with the schedule and like touching the schedule, (laughs) which maybe they want to do or not. So what are some things? Okay. We've, so we've covered a lot of things. What are some of those, um, uh, those strategies that are kind of simple that someone could kind of sneak into their school day that would engage kids more in this way? Or maybe Um, not even sneak, but like a small thing that they could do like overtly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm I'm hesitant to use these actual words now 
but honestly, play breaks, right? Like, uh -huh. oh, it's it's been an hour. Everyone stand up and shake your body. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to just inter inject it throughout the day. And from um, where I'm standing in a preschool classroom, infant classroom, wherever you're working, it's just in how you structure the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Environment is the teacher. Um, but then just making, make up some games, play a game. It, play can play doesn't have to be one thing or another thing. It is anything that's engaging and joyful. So any of it, dancing, singing, you know, anything that evokes happiness and joy and gives a little bit of a break to the tension that is Mm -hmm. education <laughs> sitting, you know, sitting and listening by education yeah. I, I, I mean I love education of course we all do we all, we all do. do that's why we're here yeah um, but you know I say education with air quotes because play is also education but just right. finding little ways to infuse it and how you set up that that environment is huge mm -hmm. I love that and I think too it, at the elementary and even the middle school level, there are ways to bring in movement and play-based uh, curriculum, right? Into any okay. content area, um, dramatic arts, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't take weeks. It's not like you have to put on a, a formal play and to incorporate some sort of, you know, creative drama, a pantomime to demonstrate something you're learning, you're reading about, you know, to help children not only move around, but also think differently and use their bodies, right, during regular lessons. So yes, play has so many faces and it's a, just a beautiful, it's like, it's just such an amazing, I think, um, tool that is underutilized and maybe undernoticed, particularly in those elementary and uh, middle school grades. Mm -hmm. Also, I would say a practical thing is if you're a classroom teacher, please take your kids outside for recess. <laughs> if you do it once, if you have one daily recess, can you fit in another one after lunch and see what happens? See, mm -hmm. see what the focus is like and see any changes that um, might happen that could actually be good when you trade in those 15 minutes of academic time for some outdoor unstructured play. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You just said something that actually made me think of something. You don't even have to call it play. You can just say today's science lesson, we're going to go outside and mm -hmm. do our science outs. We're going to look at some insects outside. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That's play. Mm -hmm. Take it outside. Take everyday learning outside because play happens out there. Of course. Yeah. Of course. In Oregon, like that's a, it's a thing that, that every is parent hears. We go outside rain or shine because we get rain a lot of the year. So yeah. pack something that makes it possible for your kid to go outside and come back in, you know, and be happy about it. Yeah. Um, some ideas. This is not my realm. This, of course, this is yours. But I uh, from the reading that I did, two things came to mind. One is that um, in some of the research, it wasn't written as a policy that kids get at least 30 minutes of recess during their day. And so something that I thought maybe elementary schools could do is look and see how much time do they currently offer for recess? If it's at least 30 minutes, why not write it down as a policy mm -hmm. so that you can just maintain the thing that you're already doing. And that if, if somehow it comes up that we need to take a little bit of time away from recess, it now becomes a policy issue where we have to now write a new policy and agree that we're not going to allow 30 minutes at least for every grade level. We give people breaks in their jobs. We say, you have this many yeah, breaks and yeah, you need to take this. them. Yeah. You are required to take them by law. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. was something that came to my mind is like, why not just write it down as a policy? I don't know what it takes to make a policy in a school, but if it's something you're already doing, write it down mm -hmm. and see if some, mm -hmm. if we can just get it approved because we're already doing it. The other thing relates to the schedule, which is that it has always baffled me why recess comes after lunch. Um, my kid comes home and half her lunch is eaten because she doesn't want to miss out on recess. And so, and um, I know a colleague, her son's school that he used to attend, they made the shift where they put recess before lunch and it was wildly successful. Kids were able to go play. They came in hungrier and lunch actually served as like a transition from yep. that, that free wild time outside to sitting down and doing something that they needed to do for their bodies because they were so hungry. So that was another idea that I thought of is like, why not just 
send kids out to recess before lunch so that they can come back in and use lunch as a transition time. So those were two mm -hmm. of my ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for talking all about this really important topic um, and sharing with everyone what they can do to infuse free play uh, in the work that they do in their schools and programs. So thank thanks you. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.